short problem we've got. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, one of the last talks of the conference. I hope you enjoy. Just a little bit about me. Um, I have two kids, a daughter of four and a son of seven. He just turned seven. And this is me uh, baking uh, poffertjes. So poffertjes, I come from the, from the Netherlands, and poffertjes are like pancakes that are very you know, well known in, uh, in the Netherlands. So if you want to uh, go visit uh, Amsterdam, you should definitely go uh, get yourself some poffertjes. And um, this is a summer school uh, festival or a celebration. And why I like uh, baking poffertjes for the kids is because it gives them a very like, nice feeling when I bake and then I can create, I can make somebody you know, experience some nice uh, emotion of, you know, liking, uh, liking poffertjes. And I recognize cooking, I compare cooking with programming. When I was uh, 19, I moved to the capital city of Bulgaria to study. And me and my brother, we had to cook. Um, I never cooked before, my mom cooked always. So, you know, you start very small with a few ingredients. And then suddenly you start getting tired of the same cooking the same meal all over again, right? I'm, you, I'm sure you recognize that. And the mo you start adding more ingredients, you start trying out new uh, recipes, and this is a bit like a programming language. You start very small, you read the Hello World example, and then starting you build, uh, build up on that. So as you have might noticed, I love cooking, and for the rest of my talk, I will use examples from, uh, from this industry. I work for a bank, a global financial institution, ING. Uh, we are present in more than 80 uh, 40 countries, and we like to think of ourselves as a software company with a banking license, which many banks, they will think, you guys must be crazy, we are just a financial institution, we are like an old-fashioned bank. Um, we already have a microservices infrastructure, and this is uh, to tell you more about the problem that we wanted to solve, and why we built that library that I will talk about. So our challenge was the following. We were building a new application, a new business process at the bank, and we had to interact with uh, 12 different systems. And out of those systems, we had to interact with 25 different interactions, so we had to give instructions to those uh, microservices. Um, the most annoying of all was that we had a process that could take from two minutes uh, to six hours. That was because there were a lot of manual work also involved, and we had to actually create a system or an API that would handle state for us. So when you involve state in a distributed system, it becomes very, very annoying of how you solve it. So we had to build an API, and we knew that we wanted not to be afraid of changing our application code. So just a show of hands, how many of you guys uh, have broken your application unexpectedly by changing code? Well. <laughs> yeah, some people didn't raise their hand, so I'm like, whoa, I need to learn from you guys how you do that. Um, we also, uh, yeah, as I said, we didn't want to break the functionality unexpectedly. And last but not least, uh, we wanted to be able to create new functionality quickly, right? So in a, we're, a, we're a company that has history. We're not a startup. We've been operating for more than, I think, 200 years. So we have a lot of legacy, we have a lot of processes, so that's a challenge as well. How do we turn the tide around? So we asked that ourselves that question and you will look no further than this guy. How many of you guys recognize this uh, chef cook? Chef cook? Uh, this guy has also a TV show, on, I think on American TV, and what he does is he helps restaurants become profitable again. And what's the first thing that he does? Do you know? He yells and he screams and he uses some not very sophisticated English language. But for what I think I can recognize of what we tried to do at uh, ING was that this guy simplifies the menu. So the first thing he does, except for yelling and screaming at all the people, is he looks at the menu and he says, I just want to one page, so menu with, with all the dishes that you're selling. And you're thinking, well, how, what does that have to do with applications? Well, let me introduce you to Baker. It's an open source uh, library that we built in Scala uh, using all those examples from cooking. Um, 
where we developed a domain-specific language to describe orchestration logic. So, as I mentioned before, the 12 systems we had to orchestrate, our logic is spent across all those systems, and we created a domain-specific language for that. It's declarative, which means that you can just specify a recipe of what the logic means. It's like specifying, reading a recipe on, online of cooking uh, some uh, poffertjes. And it's easy to change because you write less code. So I just introduce you to recipes. It's, uh, you have interactions, what we call. Those are all the calls to systems. Uh, you have ingredients, that's data. Uh, it, Baker is data driven, which is very important to reason about uh, your logic. And it also deals with events. Events like in a kitchen, when I'm baking a pizza, one event could be that the oven reaches 260 degrees Celsius. That's when the, I put the pizza in the, in the oven. So those events are business events that also your customers experience and know they touch with your applications and then you recognize those business events. Um, we also would like to communicate and communicate is very important for developers because we like to basically just sit behind our laptops and never talk to anybody else than people that understand code. Well, in a large enterprise, that doesn't really work very well. So we are like, maybe we should start talking to our business and what do they think about our logic, their code? When you show them Scala code, they freak out. So we said, well, we maybe want to show them some graphical notation, some visualization, and maybe we'll talk to them about recipes and ingredients. They will understand that. So without further ado, let me just show you some baking of some crepes. So when I was uh, on, my, on the airport in Amsterdam, I tweeted this and then Scale by the Bay replied with, we love some uh, crepes with cream. So guess what I did on the fly back on the flight to uh, San Francisco? I prepared some code to show you how to bake crepes. And then based on this, you can reason and you can figure out how to make it work in your enterprise. So, well, what's the first thing you do? You look at the recipe. So that's the recipe of how you're baking crepes. So let me show you how it works. Okay. I'll switch back to my development environment. Is it still readable for you guys at the back? Debugging applications in production, maybe? Yeah, it's fine. All right. So I've prepared a simple test. So what you guys are seeing is some Scala code and two tests, just to also help me in giving you this live coding session. So the first unit test that I've built was to compile a recipe, which means validate that this recipe is executable. So this is basically making sure that your business process is sound and can be executed. And the second is about the runtime properties of Baker, the library that we've developed. So you can use Baker as a design time tool to uh, reason about your application logic, but you can also use it to actually execute the flows for you. So in the first one, um, I have a compiled recipe which must not contain any validation errors. So let's go and de define this, uh, this recipe. Oh. So the crep recipe, it's a recipe. Cooking crepes at Twitter headquarters. And it will require some interactions. Those are the steps in the, in the recipe. Those are the calls to microservices. Those are calls to legacy systems, to anything that you guys are interacting with. Um, I'll leave this a, a list of uh, interactions. For now, I'll leave it empty. And I'll also introduce you to sensory events. So events are like what I, just, what I mentioned. It's what, what happens. So when do I cook crabs? It's when the kids are hungry. It's another event. Kids are hungry. And then I basically say, I will create the recipe. 
it doesn't have any steps. So let's see what are the steps in cooking such a lovely meal. Um, mix the first three. Well, I forgot to mention I already defined the ingredients, so I cheated a bit because when I was timing it, I, did, I, could, I would run out of time. So <laughs> I defined all the ingredients for you. Don't have to go back to the recipe. Well, basically when you uh, cook crepes, you need milk, you need eggs, some flour, some butter and some cream. Like well, you guys mentioned, well, we like crepes with cream, so I made crepes with cream. So those are my ingredients. This is the data that I'm capturing in my flow. So now I'm talking about uh, crepes, but it's in a financial services company, we're talking about transactions, customers, all that. So this will be an interaction. It, it requires a name. Uh, so this is a mix first three. It requires a list of input ingredients. So this is when, what, what is required in, those, in this interaction. This will be a sequence of the first three. So I need milk, I need eggs, and I need some flour. And the last parameter is what does it give me? So what do I output out of this? From IntelliJ? I'll wait. We're now uh, turning the lights off. No. <laughs> no. I'll keep going, guys. Yeah. Anyways. So each interaction, each, each, each call to a system, underlying system, is also um, providing you some more data, capture some more data. So in this case, my, um, the, the mixture of the first uh, three ingredients will give me some better. So it will provide um, an, an event that says better is mixed, or let's say better is ready. So let's define this event as well is another event and it provides me with better right, so it will give me that so let's say let's see I'll just quickly create the other one so I've mixed the first three ingredients what do I need to then do I need to fry the the crepe so fry crepe is an interaction that requires the better and requires some butter, right? You put the butter in the in the pan, and then you say, "Well, the crepe is ready." So that's another event when you're ready with the frying the uh, crepe. So this will give me the crepe, right? Um, and what's the last thing? I forgot about the cream. So then I'll just serve it, right? I serve the crepe. It's the last interaction in, my, uh, in this demo so that I don't spend more time. Serve the crepe, which will require the actual crepe and it will require some cream, right? And it will tell me that the, the crepe was served this is it. So now uh, what I've defined is I've defined all the three interactions. I've decided, I've said what, requi what data is required for them to be executed and what extra data they capture. So by executing the flow, you actually accumulate more and more knowledge and this knowledge is used for later subsequent processes in your uh, steps in your process. So let's add them. But uh, here I'll make something funny. Um, let's, I will just uh, say, you know, I'll just serve. I will uh, fry or let's mix and then I'm going to do uh, what's, the, what's, what's left, I'm going to fry. And let's see what happens. I've got the recipe now. I've said you will start cooking the recipe when the kids are hungry and you will perform those three steps. 
I'll go back to my unit test and I'll run the first unit test. It's now compiling and in a moment it will run the checks if the recipe compiles. Boom! What's going on? Ingredient butter for interaction fry crepe is not provided. So now Baker will start visual and it will start verifying my recipe. And it will see that some interactions require data, require ingredients that I haven't provided of any of the sensor events. So this data, those ingredients are not there yet. So let's go back to my um, events. And I will define another event, which will be that I have done some groceries. Groceries are done and it will be a sequence of all the groceries that I've done. So milk, eggs, flour, butter, thank you. What else? Cream. That's it. Um, and here some other interesting stuff, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Why do I need that max firing limit? That's another feature that uh, if I have time, I'll explain as well. So I will also say, well, this event, it also has happened. The groceries has done, and now it's complaining. Uh, oh, because I need a list of events. So now I have another version of the recipe with two sensor events. So once is the kids are hungry, but also the groceries is done. So in your typical uh, business process in your company, you will have multiple events or many events that will happen for a particular process. Uh, so you can model all those. Well, this is not what I expected. So let me see if I can rerun it again. Okay. Oh, it's green. Wow. So the, the recipe is now valid. So that means that now, now I created a recipe. I've created a business process that validates correctly. Let's see how it looks like. So from the compiled recipe, I can do the I can get the recipe visualization. So what we're doing here is instead of in a typical environment like in the 90s and the and the previous and in the 2000s you would create some visual diagrams like UML or something like this and it would generate code after that. What we do is the other way around. We take the application code and we generate a visualization out of it. And this is how um, we can reason about the, our application logic much more comfortably. So now I will take this um, output and I will use an application called WebGraphVis and I'll generate the visual representation of my logic. So what happened, the, the gray elements are the events. This is the data. And when the data is available, are those all the interactions that I've defined. So in my recipe, I have three interactions. You see them all here. And basically the ambition of my recipe is to, to achieve a goal to serve the crepe. In, uh, in your business process, it's when maybe a customer orders a product from you, it's the delivery of that product. So the customer promise is usually uh, one of the last things in your, uh, in your recipe. But this one is like hanging and not connected, right? So I will, if I have the groceries, I will directly start cooking. Maybe that's not the idea. Let's, let's see. If I can only start cooking, I can start mixing the ingredients when the kids are hungry. All right, so let's, let's add an extra precondition in the recipe. So in the recipe, what I'm going to say is that mixing of those ingredients only will happen when the kids are hungry. And if I run the unit test again, I expect that this second event will be connected. Okay, so now it's, that's, a valid, that's a valid recipe. So when those two happen, I will start cooking. So I showed you so far the design time properties of Baker. Let me now uh, show you if I were to actually create an API or create a useful application logic that will sense those events, will give them to Baker and Baker will start executing all the logic for me. 
So what I'm going to do is we're going to go into the second part of my unit test where I've prepared a few steps. Surf, this is basically expecting the, the actual customer promise. It expects that the last event is there. It will compile the same recipe and it will generate the process ID. A process ID uh, maps one-on-one -on -one with a customer journey or interaction of a customer with your, uh, with your business process. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Baker instance. And what does it require? It requires the compiled recipe. And then it requires some implementations. So this is the actual useful logic that will be executed by Baker. So, so far I've only defined the interfaces, I've only defined the design time properties of a recipe. Now I'll create the actual runtime. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a sequence and I'll go back to my um, logic and I will implement those interactions. So those you can implement the way you like them. It could be calling APIs, could be microservices, could be uh, legacy systems, could be putting a message on a Kafka bus, it could be, it could be anything. So the mixing of the first three ingredients, implementation, will be, oh no, this doesn't make sense, it's um, mix first three, implement, and then what do I get here? I can get a function that asks, gives me all the three ingredients and I provide then an, ev uh, an event. So I will say I get the milk, which is a string in this case, I get the eggs, and I get the flour. And then I'll just print, print line it, oh. so that you can see what I'm mixing some milk, eggs and flour. And I'm also going to say that the batter is ready. So I'm going to issue that, that, ev that, that event, uh, smooth, smooth, better. So I'll copy that. So this is the implementation. So this could be the data that you need to s give to an underlying system. And then when something from the underlying system is important for the rest of your process, you give that as a payload in the event that you will issue back to Baker. So this will be then the second implementation of frying. This one only requires the batter and the butter. Butter. And then I will say that the crepe, in this case, what do I get out of this uh, interaction is that the crepe is ready. So I'll say testy, tasty crepe. And the last implementation. This one I will disregard to save some time. I will just say I'm serving it. Served. And I will also raise the event. Okay, going back to my unit test, I now have the, all the implementations and I'll just provide them as a list. So this is where we hook up the design time part of the recipe with the runtime logic. Um, I will do the implementation of the crep and also the serving of the crep. Okay, and what I also need to know is I need to tell Baker to bake the recipe So for each customer, I will bake a new instance. So it's like a customer going to the restaurant and getting an instance of that process. And I will mention to Baker that an event has happened. So for this process ID, 
uh, kids are hungry. And also, for this process, obviously, I need to run, I need to run, run some errands and do the groceries. So the groceries are done. And here I actually provide the values. So I'll just go back for a moment to not to mess up the ingredients. I'll just copy that. Going back to my unit test, half and half. What does half and half? I went to the to the supermarket yesterday and I saw half and half milk. What does it mean? It's a light cream. It's, it's oh, it's cream and milk. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now I now I get it. Half and half milk. I will do some. Uh, what is it called? Free range. Free range eggs. Those uh, poffertjes you're baking. Are buck with uh, you, uh, they're made with buckwheat flour um, and some grass-fed butter. So see, I'm just putting some actual data into the into my recipe. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a plain old cream, you know. <laughs> That's a good remark. Let's see what happens now. I will. Oh yeah. And obviously, when I have, well, when the kids are hungry, when I've made all the groceries, all the data is available. So I, should, I expect that this um, event has happened as well. That the, I have served the crab. So if it's all fine, I expect that this test is green as well, and that I see some print lines. Yeah, so I've mixed some milk, blah 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 some butter, I put in on the pan with some butter, and at the end of the day I serve the crepe. So with this I showed you how the design time properties of the library allowed me to uh, attach that with uh, implementations, around the implementations uh, in, in Baker. Maybe I can also show you how the runtime properties of the recipe look like. So. I get the visual state. I can ask for the visual state of the recipe. I still have some time. And I'll print that one as well, just to give you a taste of what you can do when you're already running Baker in, in your application. It allows you very quickly to check and to understand if, for example, you haven't shipped the product to your customer, what was necessary that was not fulfilled. And I can tell you when you're in a data center debugging something, 18 degrees in the air conditioner, it's very nice that you have some visualization to show when some customers are not getting what they're getting and what they're expecting. So when events happen, they're marked in green, and then you see how the complete flow goes. This is a very simple recipe. Uh, Unfortunately, I cannot show you the one with the 27 or something steps that we actually run in production. Um, it gets very complex real quick when it comes to visualization. So you might want to limit the visualization to only the stuff that hasn't happened. So you have, this is just a dot visualization and um, Vladimir just suggested to me before the talk that we might also use uh, plant UML to generate another type of visualization out of this. So Vladimir, thanks very much for your uh, suggestion. Guess what I'm uh, writing on the, on the fly back to Amsterdam. Um, so this is, one, uh, this is uh, what I wanted to show you of how you cook. Some things that are uh, good to know is that you can uh, use Baker for short-lived and uh, long-running flows, uh, which means that you can execute everything in memory uh, in your APIs, but you can also run long-running flows where we persist the state, all the ingredients we persist in, uh, persist in a Cassandra uh, key store, uh, key space, sorry. Uh, we take care of state. So for all the developers that are using Baker at ING, we have uh, 12 teams adopting uh, the technology and applying that with their, with their business processes. They don't have to worry about uh, creating a, a system that takes care of state. We do that for them. Um, 
as we are in a highly regulated uh, environment, uh, many of the customer data must be encrypted when it's in flight and when it's uh, at rest. So we, uh, we s uh, encrypt all the data automatically for all the teams so they don't need to worry about how to do that uh, on their own. And when something breaks, and you, or maybe you do an update of your Baker uh, functionality, we will replay all the events out of a journal so that all your processes will go to the c most current uh, state. When failure occurs, we like to model it in a, in, a, in a way of modeling functional failure as events that come out of your interactions. So you model that, you figure out what are the steps in your recipe. If something works, uh, if something breaks in a technical way, so let's say an exception of some sort, then Baker will allow you, to, uh, it will retry automatically for you, which works well if you have idempotent environment where your functionality can be called multiple times when getting the same order. With us, we're also dealing with legacy systems, mainframe systems, and let me tell you what, I don't think they knew about idempotency back then. So uh, what, that was one of the reasons why I set the max firing limit. We can limit the amount of, if, uh, we can say this event cannot happen more than one time, or this interaction you cannot call it more than one time, so that you don't make a second payment when a technical failure occurs, so me when messages uh, get lost. Um, what we've discovered very um, that works very well for us, how many of you guys have heard of the Moscow model of sizing? Well, it's basically uh, when you look into a process or when you look into a user story, you say, well, that's what we must have, that's what we should have, what we could have or what we would have. So it's basically sizing functionality of how important it is to the, to the business. And what we're saying is that we've seen successful implementation of Baker when you look into not one or two processes, but all processes in your organization and map those to what we call a capability matrix. And a capability matrix looks like this. Um, I work for a department where we're dealing with uh, non-financial transactions. So that's like opening of accounts, closing of accounts, asking for credit cards and all that sort of stuff. And we have many, many processes. Um, and they're more or less the same, and yet somewhat different. So here I show you a comparison of three processes, a checking account, a savings account, and a customer onboarding. You see some of the functionality is the same, but some is not. So we uh, create a Baker catalog with all those interactions, and then teams can combine all those interactions in different ways in their recipes. So when you build a, the actual logic in an interaction once, all teams can just reuse that, which allows us to very quickly develop a new uh, functionality. So this is uh, the URL where you can check out Baker. I'm really, um, I would be very happy for you guys to give it a go and let us know how you adopt it or how you, what use cases you uh, try to figure out and use uh, Baker. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And maybe if you have questions, let me know. Um, that's a very good question. Thanks very much. Um, actually, for our developers, we don't want them to worry about that. Uh, they're executed asynchronously, so events are handled asynchronously. You might also want to handle them in a synchronous way. So I showed you handle event, which is, an uh, which is a synchronous way of handling an event. But you can also say, I would like you to just handle the event. I don't want to wait for any underlying interactions to be executed. So that's on the use case what you want to do. In our, uh, some of our APIs, uh, we call them, uh, we split them into an interactive part where the customer is still um, with us on, on, the, on, on the journey. Their feedback is important. We might give functional or technical failures. Uh, in this case, we execute those in synchro uh, synchronous. But if, for example, the customer accepts the terms and conditions and maybe in four hours we need to send a package to his address, then we just handle all those events uh, in an asynchronous way. Um, our developers, they don't, uh, users of Baker, they don't have to worry about that. So we simplified all that uh, for, uh, for the users. So from what I've 
assume your ingredients are available at the beginning of your workflow. Do you have some latency uh, ingredients so you can get them as your process goes? Can you repeat uh, again? So your, uh, in your recipe, mm -hmm. your ingredients are available before you're starting to cook. Uh, is it possible to make them well, available lazy, lazily? So you just by getting them as they get. I mean, probably if there's some expensive request to the database, you don't want to do it if you don't need to. Oh yeah. So what you saw in the beginning of my uh, what Vlad asks is, well, how do I uh, make sure that the ingredients are supplied in a lazy way? So what you saw in the beginning of my uh, of my demo, it was only the configuration. So it was just the names of the ingredients. It was not the actual data. So this was the design time part that is basically part of your logic. And when events happen, then you provide the actual data. So I said milk, but then actually when the event happened, grocery was done, I gave it a half, half milk. So that was the actual payload. So telling me this is the part, this part of milk. Okay, and does it support branching and loops? Uh, yeah, basically what I, um, what I showed you is that I, f I joined two paths. I had two events that were joined. You can also execute things in parallel, so for developers, they don't worry about that. They just give all the interactions and Baker will decide which interactions can be executed in parallel, which, can be ex which, are, which are necessary to be executed in sequence based on the data, based on what's required and what's provided. Loops, that's a very good question. We actually, in the financial services industry, we don't really want loops. <laughs> We don't want, now imagine your account and then we have something that loops and then it depletes your account. Well, that's also one of the reasons why we apply. Return payments. Yeah, then you will make them maybe, uh, each payment would be um, a single instance of, of your recipe. We are looking into that though, because we also had a question from one of the teams, well, how do we close multiple accounts? And we actually told them, you just get, you define it as a function that gets a list of accounts that you want to close and then you just make it such that it can work with one or multiple accounts and then you just close all of them. But a good question, Vlad, thank you. I wanted to follow up, the sort of branching, so you wanted to do something different uh, based on some state. Yeah, so it's all done on the state, so it's all done, the decisions of the execution flow are done based on the data. So if all the data is available for interaction to execute, then you just get then it just executes. But what if you wanted to go different? Okay, well, that's a very good, thanks very much. Uh, you also wanted to know what if I would like to make some decisions in my recipe, that's, we have a term for that, it's sieve. So sieving like flour. A sieve is, you can, you can think of it as a pure function that gives you an ingredient, uh, that gives you, that asks some ingredients and gives you and provides you another ingredient. And based on that, you can precondition that on, on different interactions. So we use that when, we uh, capture data from our customers and we call it a customer data object. Maybe not the most, maybe not the best name. And then we would like to filter maybe on the telephone number to provision some telephone related logic. Then the interaction will be preconditioned on the telephone number and with the C function we'll just extract in a pure functional way, we'll just extract that telephone number and then let the, the flow continue. Thanks very much for your question. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you.